Welcome everyone to my YouTube channel, Video Chess Training on YouTube. I'm International Master William Pascal, and today we're doing Grandmaster Chess Lessons Part 8. This is analysis of a recent game from the Chorus B Tournament in Wijkanze in the Netherlands, 2017. The players in the featured game today are Jordan Van Forest and Erwin Lamy. Van for East White and Lamy is Black. We're taking a look at a Karo Khan defense from the ongoing 2017 B tournament at Tata Steel. E4, C6, D4, D5. This game was interesting to me, although I don't think that it's a, a game that will feature in, in a lot of YouTube analysis videos. Um, it was interesting to me because I'm personally interested in playing the Karo Khan <clears throat> both as black with Bishop F5, the so-called classical variation, which I hadn't really played all of my life. And also from the white perspective, um, previously I've, I've always played the Panov attack against the Karo Khan, but in, uh, in the future I'd like to be able to play this main line. So for me, theoretically, it's quite an interesting game. So D5, Knight to D2. A lot of people argue that knight d2 is like more flexible if black opts for a Gurganidze Karo Khan with g6. But I mean, in reality, I think a lot of people play g6 anyway. So both knight c3 and knight d2, not, um, not all that different. d takes e4, knight takes e4, <clears throat> and now bishop to f5. Personally, I always avoided playing bishop f5 as black for the simple reason that there is a massive amount of theory in the variations here. Um, historically, it's been played long, long, long time since uh, at least 50 years, and I'm sure going back before that, but the body of theory is massive, and uh, there's a lot to learn. So when I was black, I always tried to play knight d7 or knight to f6, but I think that evidence is pretty clear that um, Bishop f5 is black's best move. So bishop f5 and white now has no really good way to maintain the knight on this powerful square on e4. Occasionally you'll see players say something like knight to c5 um, and the gambit with bishop to d3, something I've played in blitz. But objectively, white's only good move in this position is knight to g3. When it's placed on a Somewhat bad square, honestly. I mean, g3, I talk about this all the time. These knight 3 squares, b6, b3, g3, and g6, notoriously, uh, knights are not very well placed from these positions. So that's in black's favor. He has to waste a move here with bishop to g6. And now white plays h4. And this is by far the main line. White um, playing without h4 doesn't seem to give white uh, as much initiative though there are some tricky lines where white is playing knight e2 sometimes knight h3 and sometimes in tandem with the move bishop c4 so if you are playing black you have to be prepared for all of these side variations involving these various plans but i think it's safe to say that uh, h4 is probably the most well studied and and the best now h6 and here for many, many years, h5 was a kind of given um, in these lines, but um, usually it's better for white to, to wait a move. So knight to f3, and now black has some options in this position to play either knight f6 or e6 or knight d7. I think that e6 in particular is really interesting. This was featured in a recent game between Nakamura uh, as black and Peter Leko as white at the European, or rather World Rapid Championship in Doha, Qatar. It's a well-known variation, but e6 provoking knight e5 quite interesting for black. In any case, here black played knight to d7, and white plays h5 in this particular variation. Bishop h7, and now bishop to d3. This is pretty much universally played by um, the simple fact that the bishop on h7 is extremely powerful 
And the bishop going anywhere else, either e2 is passive or c4, just running into the black pawn chain. White really doesn't have a better option. It is kind of amazing. We look at this opening encyclopedia here. It's sort of unbelievable. And white hasn't played any other moves in this position, just bishop d3. So Gary Kasparov Anand, we see games like that from 2003. Very rare line here, knight f6, bishop takes h7, knight takes h7, but there's really no point in that for black. Bishop takes d3, queen takes d3. So here we have the starting position for uh, what is the main line. Now, there are other lines where white leaves the pawn on h4 and doesn't play h5. That's another, another interesting possibility for white that we're not going to see today, but that... Uh, there is an argument that the pawn on h5 in the main lines of this opening has a tendency to potentially become a weakness. And so there was a trend for a while for white not to necessarily play h5. But we're in a kind of traditional position here. Now e6, I think this is good. I mean, black can certainly play knight to f6 or other experimental moves, but e6 keeps the options open. We don't have to play knight f6 right away. And now bishop f4 is the main line. Bishop f4 would be the normal continuation, then queen a5 check, bishop d2, and queen c7. But instead here, Van Forius plays bishop d2 right away, which is also something of a main line. And now black has a number of options. He would like to control the b8 h2 diagonal, so queen c7 is a move, and bishop d6 not so good because of white playing knight to e4. So if black wants to play bishop d6, he needs to play knight f6 right away, which is the main line here. But I wanted to stop here and suggest something interesting for black. If you notice this move here, a5, maybe an interesting try, because a5 played by some pretty strong players. Shimonov, Ryazantsev, Brunello, um, and Bartos Sacco. This looks to me like quite an interesting idea, kind of like getting Black's counterplay started without even playing knight f6 and trying to play like a4, a3 very quickly. Black seems to have scored well in a bunch of recent games there between 2012 and 2015. So I think this move deserves further exploration. You might... Um, you might scare white out of castle and queen side, and even if you don't, you get your counterplay started right away. So, interesting line. Um, knight to f6, and now castle's queen side. Black plays bishop e7. There are other moves, of course. Bishop d6 certainly makes sense. Queen c7 makes sense, and even a5 or c5. But usually black waits until he's better developed to play something like c5 or a5. Bishop e7, and now white has tons of moves in this position, which is kind of like a main line. Um, King b1, knight e4, queen e2, rook e1. Van Foris plays king b1, and now black played rook c8. And this is where things get interesting, because this is not really a main line. This is a kind of creative idea. Um, I can't say it's like a modern computer-generated line, because I did, I did see some games going back into the 80s, I think um, one game from Sweden from 87, or possibly as early as 83. So rook c8, modern idea. I'm getting the rook in there like in a Slav sometimes, playing for c5. It makes sense. But not too many games here. Just 17 games in this opening encyclopedia. I'm sure if you have a professional database, you can you can probably find, probably find even more. But... Um, most of the good games are in here. And we see one interesting game that stands out. Hu Yi Fan versus Shankland from 2015. And uh, that did feature the move knight e4, as in this game. But it should be mentioned that queen e2 looks like a reasonable try. The queen will get hit on d3, inevitably, in a lot of lines. So queen e2 looks like a decent alternative to knight e4. So knight e4 and now black has a number of moves. c5 is played in this game. Um, certainly it looks playable to play something like knight takes e4 and castles also 
seems reasonable. When white moves the knight off of g3 and has the cramping pawn on h5, I think the scene is set for white to intend to play some kind of attacking plan with g4, g5. And the game Hu Yi Fan versus Shanklin did feature this happening in a very interesting way. Um, as in the game here, we had c5, the obvious continuation in tandem with rook c8. This is again Van Forest versus La Mi from 2017, Wake on Um But we have this interesting possibility of white playing g4. Hu Yi Fan played this and won a very strange game against Shankland. Um, in that game, g4, we had g4, c4, queen e2, knight takes e4, queen takes e4, and now queen b6. This is a sharp position, and Hu Yifan got kind of lucky later on here, winning this game. She was clearly worse after a few a few more moves. But um, it was complicated, and give her credit. I thought about black trying to sacrifice a pawn here with a knight f6, but I don't think that black can get away with sacrificing this pawn on b7 objectively. So it looks like this, this is a key line with g4, um, but black can play c4 to get some counterplay. In the game here, this was not played. We, we don't have g4 in our game today. White can play d takes c, which doesn't look that dangerous. d takes c, um, knight takes c5, and then trading pieces. White has maybe some tiny advantage in the end game, but none of these games uh, White was able to win in, uh, in six, six games. Um, knight takes f6 is another possibility. That's what happened in the game here. So knight takes f6 check, and one of the concepts that I wanted to talk about in this video had to do with the most important thing that, that goes down in this game. Um, the pawn structure, the Karo Khan pawn structure, being primarily white square pawns. So f7, e6, b7, c6. And like in the its brother opening, the Scandinavian, um, most of the pawns are formed on these white squares and the pieces protect the dark square. So pawns protect white, pieces protect dark squares. One thing about the situation where black isn't castled yet, especially in the Scandinavian um, and sometimes in the Karo Khan, you have to be very, very careful about making a break like this, let's say c5, because white should not be allowed to push d5. If you can favorably play d5, it usually breaks black center apart favorably for white. And this also happens in the French Rubenstein, which would fall into the category of the same kind of structure. So Scandinavian, Karo Khan, French Rubenstein, where black trades d takes e4, all fit into this kind of family of pawn structures. Here, Erwin Lamy either accidentally or just mis-evaluating this position played knight takes f6 check, bishop takes f6. Now it is possible that he miscalculated or misprepared here, but bishop takes f6 is the wrong idea in this position because he needs to keep control of the d5 square. That's the only thing keeping white from opening up the position and ultimately opening up the position against the black king. So this was a major, major mistake by Black to take back with the bishop. He must take back with the knight. And there's a number of games here that featured absolutely nothing for White. Um, queen b5 check, queen d7, and queen takes d7 check. And notably, Black actually scored three and a half out of four in this position. That's, um, it seems a little bit over the top, but I would imagine this pawn on h5 in, in any kind of endgame could prove to be a kind of serious weakness. So not a dangerous line at all, it turns out. After knight takes f6, I don't know what Van Forest was planning. Um, it doesn't look like white has any advantage after knight takes f6, check. And everyone played queen b5. Maybe there's a better move here for white. 
but black has pressure on d4 and I don't really know what to suggest you know perhaps he he could have played some kind of gambit you know with g4 sacrificial idea like that I don't know but white has a very bad score with queen b5 check so Lamy just misplaying the position with bishop takes f6 and now white has a good game because of d5 and perhaps Urban thought that he had some counterplay against the white king, um, but it's just far too slow. d5, queen b6, threatening mate, of course, and now white could play bishop c1, but the following move, c3, is quite solid. Black um, maybe gets c4 in control of the d3 square, and white does put a pawn on the dark squares, but this is much simpler than tying down the bishop on c1. So white has achieved the key break, d5. He has space advantage with the h5 push. And black's counterplay is kind of like really non-existent. I mean, bishop f6, that's been shut down. And black doesn't really have enough now. The c file is kind of closed to the rook on c8. And white's threatening to open up the position. c4. And now immediately Van Forest made some mistakes. I think queen e2, even queen c2 is okay. But queen e2 is clearly the logical move. I mean, with queen e2, you pin the pawn on e6, you guard the pawn on f2, and you keep an eye on the c4 pawn. Instead, he played queen e4, which allows black to play knight c5 and gain a tempo on the white queen. This would have been the best try to sacrifice a pawn here for black with knight c5, queen takes c4, e takes um, d5, and then queen takes d5 castles. When black actually has a significant amount of counterplay because of threats like knight a4, I'm not certain that white would necessarily win this game with this extra pawn. So it would have been kind of a difficult struggle ensuing if Lamy had played knight c5. But instead, he played e5, which is probably objectively losing. His only chance for counterplay there, knight c5. So missing that, now white is in control again. He could even play knight takes e5 in this position. Knight takes e5, and Van Forest seems very tactical, so I'm sure he was considering it, but then decided he had better. And I agree, knight takes e5, knight takes e5, f4, for example, um, looks very good. White has a massive advantage at the very least, but there are a lot of good possibilities for white here, and he doesn't have to trade pieces. So instead, bishop e3 hitting the queen, and I think the most important idea here is that we're going to defend our f2 pawn and probably just trade if a knight goes to c5. Not only um, do we have a space advantage, but we have a very, very, very strong pass pawn along the d-file, white I mean. Also, we have a good knight versus bad bishop now. So just strategically, position looks close to lost for black. Queen d6, and here we're not interested in this pawn on a7, of course. Knight to d4 with a very powerful threat of knight f5. And that's what happens when black's pawns are broken up with d5. He was forced to play e5 and give up the f5 square. So crippling positional advantage here. Knight c5, queen g4, hitting the loose rook on c8, exploiting the white square weaknesses in the position. And now, queen d7. Possible that black could have played alternatively king to d8 in this position instead of the text move queen d7 but in any case after knight f5 maybe Lamy just didn't consider it but it looks like this is black's best chance to survive this position to play king to d8 now obviously the king would like to run away but it's not so easy you know to play king c7 king b8 and run away to the queen side so probably black would have lost in any case and white has a clear to winning position but practically speaking black still has a small sliver of hope with the move king to d8 
The text move in the game, he played knight d3. This simply loses material. And I'm honestly surprised here that Van Forest opted not to play knight to d6 check because this move looks to me like um, much simpler to, uh, to just win this exchange here. But I guess the position wouldn't have been that different from the game in a sense. After knight d6 check, um, looks like this, this is very, very bad for black. So I don't know. Um, much simpler to me. But he played knight takes g7 check. Bishop takes g7. Again, maybe we could argue king d8. Looks like a better practical try. Bishop takes g7. Queen takes. And then black looks to get some counterplay here with king e7. And the idea of queen f5. This is the game. Bishop takes c5. Check. Rook takes c5. Now we win the rook on h8. Black could not afford to lose the pawn on e5. Queen takes h8 check, queen f5, and this is a little bit of counterplay, but not enough. Queen f5, king a1, rook takes d5. The problem isn't really just that black is down the exchange. The problem is threefold. So first of all, black is down material. In this case, down the exchange, a rook for a knight. Secondly, the black king is in the center of the board where it can be attacked. And thirdly, and as it turns out, like most decisively, the good old Karokan h-pawn on h5 is only three squares away from queening and that actually decided the game. So getting this pawn on h6 is a guaranteed killer. Queen takes h6. We're only three moves from promoting a new queen on h8. That is bad news for black. All he has to do now is just not get checkmated and promote the h pawn. Doesn't even need to be up in exchange here. Queen takes f2, threatening mate. And rook b1 would be adequate for white. But instead he found a different plan. Queen g5 check and I guess at this point, black shouldn't have played f6. There has to be another attempt at defense in this position, perhaps king to d7. But in any case, white should be winning. I think he makes it fairly easy for white after f6, queen g7 check, and the point is that we can take on b7, winning another pawn and guarding the b2 pawn in a very, very simple and convenient way. So queen takes b7. And now the h-pawn is just going to queen. So the only way that Van Forest uh, could be stopped would be potentially if black can trade queens and bring the king to help uh, blockade that pass pawn. That's what he tries to do here. So he plays queen b6. You don't want to trade queens in this kind of situation when you're, let's say, down material and facing a powerful pass pawn. But with the king as exposed as it was, it looked like black's only hope. This forces an exchange of queens, basically, and it's um, a question of endgame technique now. But I like the way that White conducted this. Queen takes, pawn takes, and then just a direct approach. Probably there are other ways to win this, but h6, um, rook d8, and now here I looked at it with an engine. It was looking for um, tricky little lines like rook h4 undermining the queen side, undermining the c4, b6 pawns. So the computer likes rook h4 with the idea of b5 and I think a4. That's a nice tricky kind of exploitational approach. But it looks like Van Forest's way of winning the game is simple and good. h7, rook h8, and then rook h6, bearing down on another weakness here on f6. So this is really sweet, really simple, no complications, it looks good b5 guarding his pawn on c4 and then finally rook f1 knight f4 kicking it out with g3 knight to d5 and then the nice thing here g4 with a devastating threat of g5 creating two connected pass pawns that certainly couldn't be stopped so 
Lamy could do nothing but play king f7, and then it's very sweet. He just goes forward, g5, every move is forward. King g7, and now one back move, rook h1. And at first glance, you're like, well, why can't black just take on g5? But the problem is black resigned here because either resigned or lost on time. It's move 40. This was the time control. Um, as far as I know, this is where the game ended. But f takes g, it would just be a house of cards. Um, rook f5 and white is winning easily. Everything, basically, all the pawns will fall. Um, everything will fall along the fifth rank. So the position was lost probably all the way um, from the point at which uh, Lamy didn't play knight c5 and sacrifice a pawn. After white's inaccuracy, if we go back, um, if we go back here to the middle game, I would say after c4, queen e4, black's last chance is really to play knight c5 in this position, sacrifice a pawn, and have some practical chances. In the game, he played e5, and I think from this point, the game is lost because of what we talked about. The structure, the Karo Khan structure getting broken, black forced to play e5, and then from then on in, it looked absolutely winning. It required some technique from, from Van Forest, but I thought it was a good game, an instructive game. How black went wrong with one mistake. Bishop takes f6, losing control of the vital d5 square. Very, very fundamental concept in the Karo Khan. So we cannot make the c5 break if it's going to cost us white opening the position with d5. It's rare to see a top grandmaster make this kind of mistake in, um, in a serious game, but just goes to show that it happens to everyone. Thanks for joining me here on Video Chess Training. I'm International Master William Pascal, and this was, again, the game from Tata B Tournament 2017, Van Forest versus Erwin Lamy. Thank you, and see you guys soon here on the channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye-bye.